Hi. How's everyone doing? Wicked. Um, yeah, I'm absolutely gassed to be sitting <laughs> next to Diane Abbott right now. This is uh, amazing. Thank you so much um, for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. I know we don't have a lot of time, so I kind of want to just go straight into it. Um, so I guess I want to start uh, in the 60s. Um, and I want to start with you as a young black girl. Um, kind of growing up, like how, who, you are 11 years old, who were you at that point? Where you, do you think you were always interested in going into politics at that time? Was there a completely different avenue that you were thinking of? Uh, okay, good afternoon. Um, people always say I need no introduction. Actually, my name is Diane Abbott. I'm a Member of Parliament. I was first elected in 1987. I'm a Member of Parliament for Hackney North and Stoke Newington, which is not that far from here. Mm -hmm. And when I was first elected, I was the first ever black woman elected to Parliament. <laughs> um, well, the thing to say about when I was 11 is that both my parents came here from... Jamaica in the 1950s. They were the Windrush generation. Both of them had left school at 14. Mummy came here and she was a nurse. And my father worked in a factory. Um, when I was 11, my big thing was reading. In the summer holidays, I'd read like a book a day. I was just an omnivorous reader. It was, in fact, one of the most important things my mother ever did for me was that when I was five, I think, she took me to the local library and she joined me up. So I was a huge reader when I was 11. And I suppose if you'd asked me if I wanted to do anything, I would have said I wanted to write books. Um, and this is only because at school, I always did very well with my essays. I used to pin them up on the walls. So I thought I wanted to write books. But I was interested in politics in the sense that when I was little, my mother would get me ready for school. And I had, I'm trying to see someone who's had hair like I had when I was 11. I had a lot of hair. A lot of hair. It wasn't straight or anything like that. A lot of hair. So every morning, in front of her dressing table mirror, my mother would comb up my hair, part my hair, plait my hair, and put ribbons in my hair, clean, fresh ribbons every day. And while she was doing it, she'd do it around eight, and then we'd leave and walk to school. Um, this is when I was at primary school. And while she was doing it, she would have the radio on, she'd have the eight o'clock news on, and I was always fascinated by the 8 o'clock news. And you've got to imagine, this is this little black girl with her mother plaiting her plaits and with these pebble lenses and so on. And I was thinking to myself, if I was Prime Minister, I'd do this. If I was Secretary General of the United Nations, I'd do that. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> bizarrely, you might say, it's a little chubby 11-year-old with pebble, pebble lens glasses. I always saw myself as somehow being in the middle of the political action. It didn't mean that I wanted to go into politics, whatever that means, but I was interested in politics from a very young age. And of course, around that time, you had the rise of black power in the United States. Um, you had the emergence of figures like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X that I saw on the television. And I remember, I think it was the 1963 Olympics, and there were, I think it was three black sprinters who won their races in the Olympics. Yeah, and then they stood on the stand. You know, when you win in the Olympics, you stand on, you know, the, the number one is on the top and the two and the three are beside him. And all three of them did a black power salute. Yeah. I remember that very, very clearly. That seared into my mind. So I was conscious of these issues and I was interested in the world, I would say, when I was 11. Do you think for you there was ever that light bulb moment of being like, cool, I'm going to pursue this and I'm going to just do it and see how it turns out? Or was it a kind of progression and you kind of fell into it? Well, first of all, I don't see politics as a profession. If you want a profession, be a supermarket manageress. Um, my thing has always been to try and alter the reality around me. 
So now it's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Black girls weren't supposed to do certain things. Mummy was a nurse. I could have been a nurse. I could have worked in a shop. I, I could have worked in a factory. But I've always challenged what the society wanted me to do. That's partly why I went on to university. It wasn't about going into politics as a profession. It was about wanting to change the world and make the world a better and fairer place. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the black British women around you, kind of now or in the past, um, and some of the people that have inspired you, who they are, what they did, and it doesn't even necessarily need to be in relation to your to your profession at the moment or the spaces that you are at the moment, but I'm quite interested in all these people you've met along the way, specifically by black British women, in understanding the kind of role model that you are for a lot of black British women at the moment as well. Well, somebody who was very inspirational for me was my grandmother. And she wasn't actually British, she was Jamaican, and she lived all her life in Jamaica. But I remember going and meeting my grandmother for the first time. I would have been 18. I think I had either, I was either just going up to university or I just started at university. So that year, my mum said to me, do you want to go to Jamaica on holiday? So I said, oh, all right then. And then as it got closer, I thought, I don't want to go on holiday with my mother. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so I said, so I've changed my mind. She said, no, you can't change your mind. All my brothers have put the money together to buy your ticket because they all want to meet you. Because, you know, I was, I was going to Cambridge. I was this sort of little star of my generation. So I did go in the end. And um, I remember... First of all, we stayed in Kingston, where I had uncles. But then we went to stay with my grandmother, who lived in a, a village called Smithville in Clarendon in Jamaica. And Clarendon is what unkind people call bush. But um, it's kind of rural Jamaica. It's not a tribute, it's not Kingston, it's not, a, it's not somewhere where tourists go. It's rural Jamaica. Very green, very lovely, I think. Very lovely, but very green and hilly and lovely. So anyway, so I went to stay with my grandmother in Smithville and um, she was completely charmed by me because actually most of my cousins, my mother's brothers and sisters' children, had been brought up by her and then sent to Britain or sent to America a little later, but she hadn't brought me up. So she thought I was charming beyond belief. And in particular, she was impressed by my British accent. And I remember I was sitting on the steps. She had a little house, the kind of houses that people, if you know rural Jamaica, that people have there. And I was sitting on the steps, and I was talking to my cousins. And my grandmother kind of was sort of, I think, in the doorway, listening to us. And she said to herself, not to us, she said to herself, listening to me and my British accent chattering away, she said, Lord, she refine. It's how she refines so. <laughs> so she thought, she thought she was really impressed. But I always remember when we um, came back from Smithfield, that first visit, we took the bus from Smithfield into Kingston. And we brought all these big cases with us from Kingston. Partly, I think, because my mother had stuff for her mother and other relatives in Smithville. So when we had to go back to the stop to get the bus back into Kingston, my mother and I were lugging these suitcases. My grandmother said, no, 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 no. And she took them, I think there were two, maybe three of them, and she put them on top of her head. You know, because that's that generation of West Indian women who carried stuff on their head. And she just, so she was walking along with these three suitcases on top of her head, and she just looked extraordinarily graceful, extraordinarily at ease, extraordinarily proud, and that has always been an example for me. My grandmother's ease and grace and inner strength. And I'll just say one more story about Smithville, um, which is not to my grandmother. But when I was finally elected to Parliament, which was 1987, that Christmas, I went back to Smithville for Christmas. So I went to church in Smithville with my uncles, I think it was Frederick Russell and Charlie Brown. So we were in the church, we listened to the service, then at the end of the service, the church elder, who was called Sister Kate, 
did the announcement. My sister Kate knew my mother. She taught my mother Sunday school. My sister Kate, she announced the choir. She announced the Bible reading classes. She announced the women sewing sock, whatever it was. And then she said, and I'm delighted to see that in the congregation with us this morning is a hempy all the way from London in England, little Lucy's daughter. Because it's a community where what matters is not your smart suit or your iPhone or your important job, but whose daughter and granddaughter you are. So I come out of the church, I'm standing on the stand, little church in Smithville. And to understand this part of the story, you have to understand, Smithville is really small. Smithville doesn't really cover, the, the, ta the kind of village centre doesn't necessarily cover the footprint of this whole building. So I'm standing on the steps of Smithville, and this woman rushes up to me. She knew my family. Smithville is small, so everyone knows everybody else. And she said to me, when I hear that a black woman become a MP in England, I was so proud. But when I hear that a black woman become a MP in England, I know it was someone from Smithville. <laughs> <laughs> so if anything has, has helped me in life, it is, it is coming from a people, a rural people, but a people that believe you can leave their district, mm. leave their village, and you can conquer the world, and that's helped me. Um, Travelling up to the 80s now and being kind of at the centre of this and, and in your stride, especially in 80s Britain as well, um, I think talking about some of the, the challenges that you came across during that period um, directly from you, I think would be, uh, is something that we should talk about and really touch on. I think we, we have a gist of... From what we know of you and your journey, we have a gist of, of some of the challenges or some of the things that you faced at that time. But actually, it was quite a visceral era, kind of like what you were saying in the, growing up in the 60s, um, going through to the 80s as well. So I think, yeah, what were some of, I guess, the key challenges at that time when you were just in your stride of, 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 of politics and activism, I would say? Well, the key moment for me in the age of the Brixton riots they were the first major riots on the English mainland. And they were, they caused a sensation in the media because there'd never been um, black people rioting before. And I remember going down to Brixton, maybe the day after or the weekend after, and there was still the glass in the road, there was still the smoke. And it, for me, it was an extraordinary <coughs> moment. And it was an extraordinary moment for the society because it forced them to look at issues around race in a way they'd never done before. Um, what, what, I mean, it was a very, I was very involved in the community at that time. I was involved in a black women's group called OWAD. Mm -hmm. Then I was involved in a campaign on, which was really about stop and search, it was called the Scraps Us campaign. And I got involved in the Brixton Defence campaign, trying to defend the community after the riots. Um, so, at that stage of my life, I was less, Involved in the Labour Party as such, but I wasn't really involved in the Labour Party at all. Mm. But I was involved in the community. Issues around women, issues around black women, issues around yeah. police harassment, and issues around defending communities. Mm. And so, um, still being involved in those areas, do you think um, that there were similar challenges you faced whilst, whilst you were more embedded in the community that you still face now that you're more... Um, in a political party, or do you think they were, they're slightly different? Well, sadly, the issues I was concerned about as a woman in my 20s, you know, police harassment, harassment of black people by the state, the sort of oppression black women suffer, these are still very live issues today. Mm. And although we've made progress, particularly in relation to black women, or we see black women, like yourself, and you see black women involved in the professions and with their businesses and so on. And so there, there has been huge progress, but these issues are still real issues. Mm -hmm. I, think, um, I think then white people found it very difficult to adjust to a black woman who was active and had a lot to say, and that hasn't changed much. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you um, about existing in predominantly white spaces 
Um, and especially when you're campaigning for or actively talking about things relating to black women specifically or black men specifically or black communities specifically. Um, and how you navigate these both in the, I guess, professional workplace. I think it's a lot of conversations that black women now, like you said, are still having about existing in these areas and wanting to talk about very specific things in relation to our communities, um, but having to navigate them in a, in a, in a different way. Um, and how, how you deal with that? Yeah, well, navigating um, predominantly white spaces is, uh, is a very important issue. And I spent a lifetime doing it, really. I mean, when I left, well, at primary school, I was the only black girl in my primary school, we, we were born in Paddington, when Paddington was a much more, Paddington, Nottingham was a much more diverse area than it is now. Then we moved to Harrow, and I was the only black girl in my primary school, and my brother was the only black boy. Then I went to grammar school, because in those days you had grammar schools, and again, I was the only black girl in the grammar school, and my brother was the only boy in the boys' grammar school. Then I left grammar school, and I went to Cambridge, and once again, mm -hmm. you know, Newnham College, Cambridge, about 400 girls, and there was me, and there was a mixed race girl, and there was a, a girl from South Asia. Then I left Cambridge, and I went to work for the Home Office as a graduate trainee, and I was the only black person in the building, I think sometimes it felt like. Um, then I went to work for uh, a left-wing lobby group called Liberty, and I was the only black person working there. Mm -hmm. Then I went to work for television. It was then Thames Television, the London Regional Television. Uh, it's Carlton now, I think. Anyway, I was the only black person working there, <laughs> and so on and so on. I spent my life navigating all white spaces. I think, first of all, you mustn't be frightened of it. I've heard young people that have been come to see me, as teachers come, as teachers have sent them to see me because the teachers want to put them in for Oxford or Cambridge and the children are saying, no, I don't want to go, it's, gonna, it's not going to be very diverse. And I always say, you want diversity? Go and work in Tesco's. If you want a really good education that will equip you for life, try and go to the best university you can and that might well be Oxford or Cambridge. Um, so it's, it's difficult, but first of all, you shouldn't be frightened of it. Because um, actually, when I got to Cambridge, I found that a lot of the, the young white people I met there, they too had issues in their family. They too, their lives weren't perfect. Um, shouldn't be frightened of it. I personally think it's very important to stay close to your family. Not to say you want to see your family every day or anything like that. <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I've always, I really don't talk about myself much before coming to the fact that my parents are of Jamaican origin. Now, some people wouldn't do that, but I always do that because I'm proud of being Jamaican. And I think my Jamaican heritage has made me who I am. Um, so I think it's important to understand your own personal history and your own personal family. I think it's important to stay close to other black women. Mm. I've had terrible things happen to me in my life. Um, not just in politics, but men. What can I tell you? Um, Boy. <laughs> what can I tell you? What, what can I tell you? Uh, uh, and without the support of uh, women friends, black women friends, I wouldn't have survived. Mm. So I think family, friends, a sense of your culture, and also, I've always read a lot, and I think you can learn a lot and understand a lot and get a great deal of comfort from books. Uh, I want to kind of touch on your your day-to-day, -day, um, specifically in the political sphere. Um, not too long ago, you talked about the amount of abuse that you receive on social media. I think for any black woman that's followed you or watched you, like, we've seen that. I see it a lot day-to-day. And it is really, it's upsetting to watch, let alone experience. Um, so I want to talk about kind of your day to day and how these things possibly manifest um, systemically um, within the political sphere, aside of social media as well, and how you navigate that on a day to day basis. Well, I'm fortunate in that I have very good and very devoted staff. And nowadays, I don't see all that stuff on social media. Mm, sure. And I don't necessarily see, well, I don't see some of the racist hate mail that comes in. I used to open all my posts all the time, and now they won't let me. Mm. Uh, and some of this you have to send to the police, because it's death threats and all sorts. So I, I don't see a lot of stuff on social media anymore. But you see some of it, because I don't keep off social media completely, because I, I still tweet and, and so on, and I like to see what's going on. Um, it's, um, it, the thing about it is it can get inside your head. 
And I think that's why my staff seek to protect me mm. from it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's sometimes dispiriting to realise how much hate there is out there. Yeah, I think, I think it's an important point where um, I think at the moment with lots of black women that are prevalent in whatever field they're in, it could be politics, it could be um, sexual health, it could be anything we see a lot um, with the amount of, because of their hypervisibility, the amount of hate that they get on social media. Um, not too long ago, um, I think uh, Black Femme Film threw a kind of celebration in your name, um, or just people that were campaigning for wanting to celebrate you. And I think you went to that as well. How did it feel just to be in that space? Because I think it's not, we don't often see you in spaces filled with other black women just wanting to celebrate you as we are here today as well. How did that moment feel of just being oh, it, felt, it felt fantastic. Um, because I do stay close to my friends, and, and because in the past I've done a lot of work with like projects with black people. Like I've had a project for years called um, London Schools and the Black Child, which is about education, and, and uh, we do stuff with black businesswomen and so on. So we do have events, but that particular event which I wasn't expecting, which I hadn't put on, it was full of people I didn't really know, and they were so positive. It was really wonderful. I've been through a difficult time. I think it was after the general election, mm -hmm. and it was very upsetting and you know, very demoralising. And it's, it's really, it was really uplifting to realise that so many people that you, you didn't know knew about you, cared about you, and wanted to celebrate you. What do you think the current climate is now for black British women that are... Uh, interested in getting into politics or interested in getting into community activism, all these spaces, do you think the climate has progressed in any kind of way? Do you think there are similar barriers that black women now will face that you faced? Or do you think there are, are more opportunities that black British women should be holding on to at this point? Well, I think some of the barriers I face still exist today. But the truth is there are many more black women in um, community activism and even in parliamentary politics than there were when, when I started out. You've got, um, I can't remember, I think it's about 11 black women in the Labour Party. You've got you know, black and Asian women in the Tory party. That wasn't the case 32 years ago when I first became an MP. So there are more people out there. I think though, and I said this at the beginning and I'll say it again, I think it's not so much about people thinking they're gonna have a career in politics. It's about people engaging with their communities. And if you're engaged with your communities, issues will emerge. Mm. And you might never want to become a party politician. Mm. I've got a good friend, she's retired now, Rose, Baroness Rose Howell, and she was always very, very heavily involved in the community. And she got very involved in the Stephen Lawrence case and so on. And in the end, she, was, she got to the House of Lords. But for Rose, it was always about community. She never wanted to be a party politician in that sense. And you can be like that, and that's fine. We need people active in the community. Um, so I think it's important to be close to the community, to work with the community, whatever your issue. Your issue could be the environment in the black community. Mm. You know, when people talk about environmentalism, a lot of people don't mention the fact that some of the communities, some of the countries that are most risk from climate change are black countries. Yeah. Um, because you've got small islands where the, the water levels are rising year on year on year. You've got places like the coast of Bangladesh. You've got the increased prevalence of tornadoes and hurricanes. That's all to do with climate change. So it'd be completely legitimate as a black person to get involved in those issues, but, but perhaps from a black perspective. So I think, there's a, I think there's a lot to do. I think there has been progress made. And although it's tough, or can be tough, people shouldn't let them put shouldn't let them be, shouldn't be put off by that. We've all got a contribution to make, small or big, and we should try and make that contribution. I want to jump back to the moment where you were first elected and that feeling. What were, what were your kind of first feelings or your initial thoughts that came to mind at that time? Well, you have to remember this was 32 years ago and there were no black women in parliament, no black people in parliament. When um, Bernie Grant, Paul Bartai and Keith Faz and myself were elected in 87, we were the first MPs of colour. Okay? I think it was 250 years after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire as well. Anyway, so there was, there was no people of colour in Parliament. And I'd gone through this campaign. It's been a difficult campaign. Um, I had bricks put through my um, campaign headquarters. And there were a lot of people, actually, Labour voters, 
who said they weren't going to vote for me. And actually, the Labour vote went down the first election I ran in, and the Lib Dem vote went up by about 8,000. And that 8,000 really was Labour voters that didn't want to vote for a woman of colour. Mm. Um, so it was a tough campaign, and there were people, even other black people, who didn't think I could win. There'd never been a, never been a black woman in here, just didn't think I could win. And I remember on the day itself, election day itself, um, there was a big turnout in some of the more Tory areas of the constituency, more Tory areas of Hackney. And that was very unnerving. But then as the evening fell, I remember it was as the evening fell, and in the streets of Stoke Newington, Stoke Newington is really very hipster now, but 32 years ago, it was, <laughs> it was very black, actually. Black and working class white people. And it was this extraordinary thing. Around tea time and onwards, the streets of Stoke Newington that came alive. And they came alive with people going out to vote. People going out to vote in a really determined way. A lot of black people coming out to vote in a very determined way. And I still meet people who say, I voted for the first time in 87 and I voted for you. And then suddenly you realise the community was on the move and it was on the move to get me into Parliament. But then when they announced the result, I was completely stunned. There were pictures of me. My mum was there. Um, and uh, some of my friends were also in the, the crowd and so on. But I was completely stunned and it took me weeks, not to say months, to really um, adjust to the idea that I was indeed a Member of Parliament. Yeah, a round of applause. I think it's such a special historical moment. Um, you, you've given so many like amazing tips and there's so many pull up quotes that I wish I could just write trying to scribble down trying to stay in, stay in the moment but what would be your kind of top tips for any um, black British women in the room and beyond that are interested in um, politics or community activism try and look good when you're a woman in public life, I've always had this thing, you know, I go on television and you want your friends to say, I thought what you had to say about Europe, Diane, was really meaningful. And instead they say, your hair didn't look very good. Um, so try and look good, because if no one else is looking, your friends are looking. Um, try and remember what you're in politics for. The reason I push back against this notion of people going to politics as a career is that has no content. I would never survive 32 years, and some of those years were pretty horrible if I didn't believe what I was in politics for. So try and remember what you came into politics for. It might, might not necessarily be anything specific to do with race. It could be environmentalism, it could be foreign affairs, it could be whatever. But try and remember what you're in politics for. Um, and yeah, try and stay close to your community, because when times are tough, it's your community that will rally to you. I remember been through horrible times, and black people who certainly have said to me, don't worry, Diane, they're going to carry you out of this place in a box, you're not going anywhere, you know, because people were saying, oh, she should step down, she should do this, she should do the other. So, um, yeah, look as good as you can, remember why you're there, and try and stay close to your community, that would be my tips. And also have time for yourself, I think that's true of any profession, mm. really, because mm. sometimes black, black women, I think, put themselves under so much pressure. Mm. And the important thing is to, to find some time for yourself. Thank you. Then we've got a little bit of time for some questions. Before we go to questions, I want to just quickly reinstate the rules of the Q&A. Don't be that person that says, this is more of a statement than a question. Just make sure you've got a question. <laughs> I will try and save some time for actual statements, but for now, does anyone have a question? Just whip your hand up quickly, and then we'll come around. Yes. I'll give you two answers. A friend of mine, um, Margaret Busby, um, has just produced an anthology of black women writers. It's called um, "It's New African Writers, I think. It's a huge anthology anyway. And that would keep you reading for a long time. <laughs> so, so I recommend uh, Margaret Busby's new anthology. The other book, and it's completely different in a way, which I sometimes mention when I'm asked, asked about books, is actually a Victorian book. And it's by a writer called William Thackeray, and it's called Vanity Fair. And the point about Vanity Fair is the heroine is called Becky Sharp. And Becky Sharp is what 
they call in the book an adventurous. She's somebody from nowhere in particular who takes on all sorts of obstacles, makes her way through society. She's not an always wholly admirable person, but boy, she's tough. And I always say, you know, Becky Sharp is one of my heroines. I've got a question, actually. If you're someone that has something that they feel really passionate about or angry about or something, but you don't quite know how to start, you don't know where to start, you don't know who to go to, what would be your kind of starting point in getting yeah getting to the stage where you're you actively doing something if you feel that the urge to well it depends what you want to do but you know i think i mean i've had a lot of nonsense online but online is a great opportunity as well and it will enable you to sit in your home and online reach out to people set up um, reading groups, or do you know what I mean? I would start by trying to engage, trying to find people with similar interests or similar concerns online and link with them, and then think of a strategy going forward. Perhaps meeting, perhaps going to lobby the council, whatever it is. Is that a hand or just okay? okay. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how that felt for you, what was that day like for you? Mm. Oh, it, it felt fantastic. Um, but even on election day itself, I had supporters come into Hackney to, to work, to knock on doors and get people out, because people were worried. And some of these were white people, you know, just general supporters who were worried, because of the awful attacks in the media, the actual election was going to be a struggle. By about lunchtime, they're saying, we're off to a proper marginal diet, and this is fine. These people are going to come out and vote for you. Um, so no, it, did, it felt fantastic, and it felt like a vindication. Because if you're seeing all the time in the media, all this negativity, you do internalise it. And the fact that I was able to get a majority of 35,000 made me feel a little bit better. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Diane Abbott. Auntie Diane, thank you so much. It's been amazing. Look, I had to say it. I had to say it. Thank you so much. It's been amazing to be able to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.